Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Luke Groman. Remember, new shows are posted every Monday and Thursday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Now today I spoke with the founder and president of Forest for the Trees, Luke Groman. We talked about his philosophy for doing macro research and how history plays an integral role. Luke explains his process for developing a macro report. We talked about position sizing different macro themes and how he determines when he's wrong on a macro idea. Finally, Luke tells us his biggest macro theme for 2019. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Luke. Luke, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to speak with you today, Luke. I want to start off by talking about Forest for the Trees, your macro research company. Now, everybody knows I'm not a macro trader, but I read and listen to a lot of macro because that's where I get my ideas uh, for themes that are taking place in the market. But I have to be careful, Luke, because... Since I'm not the one doing the, the macro research, it could take me a couple of different ways. Macro research can be very subjective, as we all know. So I like to understand the person's philosophy for doing the research before I use it. So what is your philosophy to providing macro research? Yeah, thanks for having me on it. You know, it's, it's a little bit unique, I guess, from the standpoint that I spent... Um, uh, over our nearly 20 years on the sell side, uh, first as a research analyst and then as a uh, uh, equity salesperson, institutional equity salesperson, um, at, at a couple different shops that were very uh, bottoms up, uh, deep in the weeds research. We were early pioneers in surveys and some things like that in, in, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. At any rate, what I found uh, by doing that and how that influenced my process was that when you start, I, I, I just sort of learned that I had a, a, a unique ability to put a lot of different disparate data points together that would then point very accurately in, an, in a, a, a relevant time frame and uh, in an investable manner um, macro themes as well. So, you know, we're doing surveys on, you know, heavy duty truck dealers and, and we're talking to Caterpillar dealers and we're, you know, we're doing all this really deep in the weeds stuff. And I found I was able to, you know, take these surveys and go, gosh, you know, expectations for inflation are way too high. The economy's really slow and I need to buy, tre you know, I need to buy 10 year treasuries. And it worked. And so it influenced the process I'm at you know, where for FFTT, which is we aggregate a very large amount of uh, information from a whole bunch of publicly available uh, resources. Uh, and and we're, we're basically trying to identify uh, developing economic bottlenecks from a macro perspective. So it's very much a, a, a macro shop that's informed by uh, micro, you know, you know, influences from from my past. So you say it's a little bit unique, and, and I totally get that. I hear that in your explanation. But what is your edge versus other macro research firms? You know, I think there's a couple edges. I think um, 
the willingness to look through a different lens at things. The example I've used in the past is for a long time, the Roman Catholic Church got astronomy wrong because they thought the Earth was the center of the universe. And it's a good example where that was the science. It was supported science. Um, and, you know, Galileo came in and said, yeah, no, you're wrong. And, and they didn't like that a whole lot. Um, but the reality, of course, was is, is that the Earth wasn't the sun of the so or the center of the solar system, and so you know some of it is is a different lens um, of of uh, you know some of it is being willing to take a look at history. Um, you know, we have repeatedly said perhaps the most undervalued assets on Wall Street are history books. Um, most people tend to take a linear view of history, and you know the reality is is human nature is repetitive and cyclical, you know, humans are, are, you know, greedy and fearful, and that has never changed throughout history. Um, and so, you know, looking back in history allows us to begin to do pattern recognition, not often um, uh, employed by a lot on the street. I think some of it is our location, you know, we're in Cleveland, Ohio, which is, you know, away from the money centers, and that gets us away from a lot of the group think, and I think that speaks to um, the using a different lens point earlier. The, the overall thing that, you know, sort of that, that we always look for, uh, and this goes back to my, my days as a, as a stock picker on the sell side, we were doing in, individual security research, which is what do I know that other people don't? And so I'm always looking at macro from a standpoint, you know, it, you know, we tend to be a little bit, you know, more thematic. But, it, but I always have in my head sort of that, that trader, that salesperson's mentality from sitting on the sales trading desk for almost 20 years of what do I know that other people don't and that other people are positioned for? Because if I can't identify that, um, then to me, you know, my confidence level in that idea or that theme uh, begins to wane. So it's always, you know, trying to be aware of that. I want to talk about something that you just mentioned and you said history and as a technical trader, a big aspect of me building my technical strategy was looking back at setups that I liked and to see how they worked. So I could compare not an exact situation, but pretty close and I could see what happened next. And, and over time you look at enough of them, you could develop some probabilities as to what may happen next. I'm not sure how you do that with macro, right? Because it just seems like things are so different as we move on, especially this day and age. I mean, I look at what's happening now versus what's happened in the past. It's like, how do you compare it? So how do you use history? It's a great question, you know, and I had never really thought of, you know, the the, the charts like you talked about, but I get, I, in the minute you started describing it, it totally made sense to me. And it's sort of some of the, some of the same, right? They, you, um, you know, I'll, I'll use a perfect example. Um, there was a period of time after uh, international tensions where uh, global sovereign debt levels got uh, way too high. There was a lot of concern about how to do that. Uh, a couple of the players had um, uh, what were effectively uh, entitlements that were inflation adjusting. So they, you know, they needed to either cut them, which was politically unpopular, or they had to print the money. But if they printed the money, because they were inflation adjusting, you know, the liability would just keep rising. Um, you had a credit, you know, it was creditors against debtors and no one could agree how to work it out. And all of this sounds, you know, kind of a little bit like today between U.S. and China and Social Security and, you know, you know, 20 years of wars and the, you know, the U.S. has been involved in. But it's not. It's actually after 1918. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so those are the types of things I'm looking for. Where, you know, I almost take a step back and what I look for are the, you know, I almost, you know, try to blur the historical vision or, or reduce it to its motivations and its essence, right? So you you know, we're not talking about that, you know, you know, Weimar Germany had all these obligations and they owed all this money and, and they ended up, you know, and, and, and you know, the, the, the emotions of the situation, but rather to completely detach myself from what it was. And it was a nation that lost a war. It was a nation that lost its manufacturing base. It was a nation that owed a ton of debt and a ton of entitlements. And how did they get out of that? And once you start just stripping out the, you know, because history is a very emotional subject for people, 
uh, once you start stripping out those emotions, which is something most people can't do, I'm, I've come to find, um, then you can start applying it forward like what you're doing with the charts, which is to say, well, do we have a nation that got rid of its manufacturing base and has spent a bunch of money in wars that it hasn't won and owes a bunch of money that it doesn't have? Down in, yeah, the United States. Um, you know, do we have one that looks like China? Yeah, we do. We've got you know the biggest creditor in the world and the manufacturing factory of the world that everybody owes money to. That was the United States in the, in the teens and in the 20s. Uh, and, and so if you start stripping things down to their essentials, to me, is how I have historically uh, uh, done that. And then, you know, what's critically important is you then have to take a step back and say, okay, where are the differences as well? Unemotionally look at those, right? We, I used the U.S. example before, uh, after World War, as, you know, the German example of some of the same situations the U.S. finds it's in today. Well, there's also some very big difference. They had like six political parties and they, you know, the, the losses in those wars were much, much greater. The political divisions were much, much greater. And so then you start saying, OK, well, you know, the 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 you know, the analog is not directly, you know, the U.S. is Weimar Germany. The analog is there are some similarities here. And then we try to start to say, OK, well, how are these? We, we try to establish a range of outcomes uh, of potential outcomes. And where historically we get really excited is when people say, you know, consensus is at, you know, one end of a spectrum and our range of outcomes, however wide that may be, like is, is it completely the other end of the spectrum because now investment positioning might be very, very off. And that's where we start to get really excited about writing and identifying uh, a, a, a macro thematic uh, trade um, uh, to our customers. All right. You've mentioned a few things already that you used history as a comparison to something that's happening now. Can you take us to current day and give us an example of a recent report that you put out where you did use history as a comparison to help you with what's happening now in a macro trend? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we did a report um, a, a little over two months ago, um, and, and the, the genesis of it was Paul Volcker. Uh, coming out, I can't remember which media he was on, but he said he sees uh, the U.S. is in a hell of a mess in every direction. And to me, I thought that was really interesting, giving some of our historical readings, because when you start putting the pieces together, what you realize is Paul Volcker had a critical hand in the construction of the currency system as it currently exists, as our global monetary system currently exists, all the way back to uh, the early 1970s when uh, Paul Volcker was charged uh, by Henry Kissinger to basically, not to basically, to, to effectively figure out how the U.S. could maintain its hegemonic position, and those were Kissinger's words, not mine, uh, if uh, the U.S. was starting to run deficits. And what Volcker came up with was, well, we just need to figure out other countries to recycle their deficits or their surpluses into our economy. And so, you know, we did that for the Europeans, and then they launched the euro, and the European, we stopped having European uh, surpluses to, to recycle. Uh, so we immediately found a new, a new uh, 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 surplus nation, uh, China. And, of course, uh, we've seen what happened between U.S. and China trade from 2001 forward uh, until 2013. And now you've got, you know, a situation where the U.S. needs a new... Uh, surplus region to basically recycle into our capital markets and into our government. And it's unclear who that's going to be. Um, and once you start realizing that, like to me, for Volcker to say a hell of a mess in every direction with his, you know, his intense involvement and understanding of all of this, um, to me, then speaks forward to, OK, look, the, the, the U.S. has a, you know, has a has a funding problem and the initial uh, mechanical impacts of that should be to drive the dollar up initially. OK, where are we on that process of the dollar rising versus where we were when this process started four or five years ago? You know, what what might change? What does this mean for Fed policy, which, you know, we think they may have to reverse course much sooner than most people think, etc. So that's a, a good example, I think, of a, of a report we wrote a couple uh, months ago you know, for our customers where we just sort of said, look, the big, you know, the, the, the big gear moving is the U S is the U S needs new surpluses to recycle. And we, there aren't any that, that are easily identifiable in the amounts needed. 
And then what does that mean for both the macro theme for this year, but also some of the trading moves in, in some of the key things, dollars, rates, Fed policy, uh, foreign, foreign currencies, emerging markets, risk assets, treasuries, etc. All right. I want to talk about your process for developing a macro report. Uh, as a trader, I have a process. I do my homework, all, all my preparation. Then I have my anticipation stage where I'm watching things set up and then I execute. What is your process for developing a macro report, a macro theme? Sure. So I, I you know, the first part is reading extensively. You know, I, I've equated myself to being uh, like a, a catfish down at the bottom of the river, just kind of sitting at the bottom and letting stuff float down, if you will, um, down river to me. Um, and what I, you know, the so the that's the method. The, the the art to it is is I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't start with a theme or what I think is happening. I try to let what I see developing um, across, you know, mainstream print, online, alternative, uh, social media, uh, et cetera, dictate to me, you know, hey, okay, there's, I've seen that once, I've seen that twice. I start seeing themes come up and so I set them aside to myself um, and I, that goes into what I call our cutting room. And then, you know, when it's time to write a report, we write an eight to 10 page report every Thursday um, you know, I go to the cutting room and I start looking at sort of, you know, what bubbles up from the page. Um, and once I kind of start seeing what's bubbling up from the page, you'll, you know, I'll get a thematic, you know, of what something that might be occurring. Uh, and then what I try to do is I try to find um, whatever that theme that is bubbling up. I try to find people that would basically argue it to the death. You know, basically the people that are think I'm, you know, a complete lunatic on the other, you know, totally wrong and read their arguments and see if they can punch a hole in the theme that seems to be bubbling up. And if I can't find anyone to punch what I would say is a, you know, a, 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 a very good hole in it, uh, you know, not something around the edges, then I think there's something really interesting to highlight. And then I also try to and once that and once we're done with that is is really um, you know, compare where uh, this theme sits relative to consensus out there, right? So, you know, you know, we had a theme. Perfect example is is late 2016. It was starting to seem as if, you know, based on a number of themes, that 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 the you know the dollar was going to have to fall pretty notably pretty soon to avoid you know a much worse outcome. And this was at a time when. You know, everybody was wildly bullish the dollar. You know, you had the, you know, George Washington dollar bill looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger circa 1982 on the cover of The Economist, you know, and, and um, you know, everybody loved the dollar. And we were starting to see things that, like, maybe they shouldn't. And so that was sort of, a, you know, that was an example where this process, um, you know, started bubbling up like, gosh, this shouldn't be happening if the dollar is going to go up next year. And this shouldn't, and this shouldn't, and this shouldn't. And then you read sort of all the cases of why the dollar is going to go up next year. And you go, okay, I understand that. None of that makes me feel any worse. And boy, the sentiment is so over the top bullish dollar. Hmm, maybe there's something here. And, and what I've always found is, you know, those trades that end up being the best ones, at least for me, are those ones where I'm like scared to death to even hit send on the report because I just know I'm going to get kicked in the head. You know, so you're just like kind of nibbling at it. But um, that's 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 how we kind of um, that, that's how we we, we, we do the process. Um, you know, and I think a lot of that is sort of the secret sauce of, of what we do. I also want to talk about position sizing, because for me as a trader, I, I have scenarios where I trade smaller. I have scenarios where I look at something and just go. I'm getting a setup, but I'm just not going to trade it. And then I have scenarios where I look at it and go, this is a full trade. I have to be all in here. Um, do you have that as someone who is doing macro research? Do you have different ones, different reports that you may say, look at this one's a, this should be a full position. This one is a, uh, uh, something that's already, uh, underway everybody. So be careful. And this one is something that this isn't quite set up yet, so be patient. You know what? I don't do it that explicitly. Uh, I probably should, quite honestly. Uh, but we we try to do it more uh, uh, explicitly, and 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 in particular, it doesn't happen often. But there are times where there is like the 
get on the table, jump up and down, and you know this is happening. You know, uh, type of of thing. I mean, a perfect example of that I would say was back in mid October. Uh, we were having a conversation with somebody. We had, you know, it's always important to have the context, right? If you would kind of understand what's happening around you, then when that last puzzle piece falls into place, you can really push, right? You can really, you can really press your bet. And like I said, it doesn't happen much. But I was on a, having a conversation with a with a macro trader, uh, one of my one of my best relationships on the street, you know, and he just said to me, he "Goes, are, are, did you see what's happening in cross currency basis swaps?" And we had already done a lot of work about rising tensions on the U.S. fiscal side and, and that foreigners were no longer buying treasuries and this is problematic. And what he highlighted was basically cross-currency basis swaps were starting to price foreigners completely out of the treasury market. And you go, oh, my gosh. Like that's – to me, it was – I got punched in – it felt like I got punched in the stomach in a way I hadn't been – I hadn't felt since probably the fall of 07. Uh, when I'd heard some data points that literally had me go to 100% cash and kept me there for 18 months. Um, but those types of things, when I see those situations, those setups, I try to identify those uh, and be as, as um, aggressive with them as possible. Um, but, you know, by, you know, but, as you can tell, I'm, I'm describing something that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, because as a trader who reads a lot of macro, to me, when I see a report, I don't know, let's just use you know a recent example. All of a sudden now, if I read a report where somebody is really bearish on the S and P, after it just really two hundred points off the low and the break has already happened, it's like, okay, should this have been out two months ago, or is this still something that's happening? I guess because I think from someone who's not doing the research and I'm reading it, I'm always wondering, is this move underway? Has it already happened? I'm always struggling to understand where they are in their process. Did it take them too long to come out? Because markets move so fast. I mean, just look at crude oil stuff. I remember not too long ago reading some stuff about people that were bearish crude oil, and but I'm just looking at the chart going, this thing just got creamed. Are they too late? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, were they right and it's over? Because then price all of a sudden could move and they might still be right in, in, a, in a macro sense of things, but price has now moved against them. I guess a good follow-up for this is, how do you know when you're wrong? It's a great question. Uh, well, you know, at the end of the day, price determines, right? Um, and I think that that's important. Well, what we what we try to do when we're writing for our customers on this is you know hey here's what we think is going to happen and, and if we're right you know this range of outcomes should happen um and something that has been you know that i have a lot of empathy for practitioners such as yourself portfolio managers etc has been the degree to which uh politics politicization of markets weaponization of markets um has just increased, increased, increased over the last 10 to 12 years. And, um, you know, there have been a lot of times where you can get the fundamentals right. And, you know, the authority, the authorities have the means, <laughs> means willingness and, 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 you know, means motive and opportunity to overrule you. And that, that may sound conspiratorial on some levels, but like, look, like, like Powell is a perfect example two weeks ago or, you know, 10 days ago. Right. I mean, like, when you know, <laughs> it's not central planning, but when we're all sitting around waiting to see if he's going to flip flop or not, like it's sort of central planning. And so it, it long winded way of saying what we try to do, you know, number one, price determines. Number two, we just try to be open with our customers of like, listen, here are the risks to the trade and, and to be cognizant, not to be sort of, you know, a, uh, you know, Pollyannish about what's happening around us in terms of some of the, you know, some of the, the, the political and market realities. And, you know, and some of that ties back to the historical lens of, of listen, as, as, as governments get into, you know, fiscal pinches, the rules go out the window. Like, the governments don't care about your markets. They care about, like, you know, getting, getting what they need to operate. And they will break all the rules to do it. And, uh, and so just being aware that that, 
that that's the reality in which you're operating. And whether that means, you know, as a trader that, you know, you work with lower stops or you take your positioning sizing down more until you really feel good. Or, but that that should influence your process in some way as a trader. You know, A, you should know that. And B, it, it should influence it in some way. But the way we try to work that in is just, you know, being vocal, being open to our, and sharing our thought process. It's not here's what's going to happen. It's here's what we think might happen. And here's why. And, you know, if we're wrong, it could be, you know, this or that. Do you look at any technical trends or is it purely fundamentals? It's mostly fundamentals, but it's, you know, the, the when I, the way we have historically used technicals, you know, has been, you know, I defer to others because I am, you know, they're, 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 there's technical guys that will have forgotten more than I'll ever know. And I know that. And so where, you know, by virtue of just sort of how my brain works and how our product is positioned, what I'm really looking for and using tech, you know, technicals for are sort of the big, the big breakouts or the, the big breakdowns, you know, sort of, you know, almost like a Geico commercial, right? Like so, so easy, even, even a technical idiot like Luke can, can see what's happening here. And, and when we look at those big moves, it's always in the context of what we're, you know, what, what, what are what are ongoing um, whatever themes we may be uh, saying that are bubbling up from the fundamentals um, and see if it's confirming or denying and then you know if they're confirming or refuting then that you know particularly you know it's kind of that, that's part of the reason why we use sort of the big moves on the technicals right is because if it's just you know if it's just you know sort of week to week or day to day type stuff even even you know uh, it, it, you. I understand that in terms of positioning, but that's not really what we do per se. There's people that are going to be able to do that for you better. But what I really want to see uh, if the technicals are supporting or refuting or whether there's, there's something really big happening. And so that's historically how we've used them. Do you ever hold back from posting a, a macro report because of something you're seeing in technicals? No. Uh, the I, I will say we probably use some language that would say, hey – you know, some qualifying language in a report that we might not otherwise use. Um, you know, it looks like the dollar is, you know, is, is breaking down a bit here, but we continue to think it'll rally or we think it's, you know, we think it's, it's, it's fallen too far and probably due for a rally. But we continue to think that, you know, as we look out over the next three to six months or two to three months that, you know, these trends are likely to play out it, it more, you know, as qualifiers than as an absolute, hey, you know, this thing's going in the, this thing's going in the, in the drawer, uh, because of them. Biggest macro theme you see happening in 2019. I think the key question for 2019 is when's the fed going to reverse course and begin growing their balance sheet. Like the BOJ is that late 2019? Is it early 2020? Uh, is it later than that? I don't think it is. Uh, it could it be earlier uh, than late 2019. I think it could be depending on how economic trends play out. The, there are few people paying attention to what's going on in sovereign debt because you just have never had to think about it. It kind of ties back to that example I used before. You know, everybody that, you know, we're in a global sovereign debt bubble. You've got all this debt yielding near 5,000 year lows that is uh, full faith and credit of a bunch of governments that if you look at the numbers, they're broke. They're all broke, in the, particularly in the West, but, you know, depending on how you allocate it, others as well. And no one's thinking about it because it's just, well, that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. And it's been tomorrow for our entire lives. But tomorrow's becoming today. And how fast tomorrow becomes today will depend on how quickly uh, the global economy slows. If there's a crisis anywhere in the world, that will speed this up. And the people that traded through the last global sovereign debt bubble, uh, you know, uh, bursting, were born uh, between 1880 and 1900. And so they're all dead. So they're not around to kind of say, hey, when you see this, you know, this means this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You know, but in the last global sovereign debt bubble, the way it worked out was the sovereign debt of the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, Russia, Germany, France. So basically all the major powers of the day fell on a real basis, adjusted for currency by 60 to 100 percent in under 12 years. And that's the kind of like, you know, the kind of thing that is and it's happened over and over and over, but it just it's a long cycle. But we're at that point in a long cycle. And so to me, when you understand the severity of what we're marching towards, I then pull that back to 
what does that mean for Fed policy? And to me, if the Fed has an ounce of understanding of history, uh, et cetera, they understand they're walking around with a lit match in a giant factory of nitroglycerin. And do they really want to keep that match lit for a little too long? And my bet is they will consistently say no um, for good cause. And so uh, to me, to answer your question directly, I really think the story of 2019 is going to be you know, the shift from, you know, Powell's the man, he's the Terminator, he's going to kill everybody and take the dollar to the moon to, boy, Powell's like Yellen, who's like uh, Green, who's like Bernanke, who's like Greenspan, who's, you know, uh, you know, so that to me, I think is a big theme we're setting up for and one we're watching in our research for sure. What are the top data points we as traders should be watching uh, that you believe will cause the Fed to reverse course? I think it is. Um, I, I think it is two things. I think it's the economic data that I think most people are watching for. But then I also think uh, the underappreciated one is what's going on with U.S. Treasury auction bid to covers. Um, it's something nobody has really ever had to think about. Uh, but they've been, you know, trending down and to the right for four or five years. Um, and uh, now you've got a situation where foreigners aren't buying treasuries like they used to or at all. And um, at, at some point you get to, you know, you know, a, a dangerous spot where, you know, I think as Ray Dalio said it, look, there's there's not enough foreigners to buy this stuff and we're going to have to buy it ourselves. And we are. And the challenge there is, is that eventually gets to a point where, all right, I can go out to eat as a family or I can buy a treasury bond. And, you know, going out to eat or taking a vacation is more interesting and fun than the treasury bond. And, and once you get to that point, and I don't think we're there yet in terms of crowding out, which is what that's describing. Uh, but we're, but we're, we're, you know, we're in the early to mid innings of crowding out, and at some point, then the Fed's going to have to get pulled back in. So to me, you know, the two things I'm watching are are, are the global economic trends um, uh, that, that 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 I think we all you know, we all sort of watch, and then the second one that I think is more underappreciated are these U.S. Treasury auctions as, as these things just keep getting bigger and bigger and the foreign demand just keeps getting weaker and weaker. Excellent insight today, Luke, but we're not done yet. I have rapid fire questions if you're ready for those. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Luke, what trader has influenced your life the most and why? So there were three gentlemen that I sat on the trading desk, uh, sales trading desk with at Midwest Research that taught me a variety of, you know, skills as a young guy from from trading and markets and and one guy was really great on client interactions and sort of just reading meetings and situations. And one guy was just a consummate sales, you know, just salesmanship, really a couple of those guys, consummate salesmanship. And so they really um, helped me in terms of, uh, you know, uh, from a complete standpoint, um, you know, understand the markets much, much better than I ever would have, much more rapidly than I ever would have otherwise. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? Position sizing. <laughs> Too big. <laughs> How has your trading process evolved over the years? Um, you know, in terms of the personal stuff, uh, trade a lot less. Um, you know, be right, sit tight, identify that my advantage isn't in out trading guys with a lot more experience and a lot more capital, a lot more computers, and more in understanding further out on the spectrum and position, you know, and, and on a time line and trying to capture the alpha that exists you know, six and 12 months out as opposed to, you know, day to day. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? Open-mindedness. Favorite book about trading? Moneyball. Favorite movie about trading? Big Short. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about trading? Position sizing is key. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice what would it be? Trust your intuition. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in macro research, what would it be? <laughs> um, 
you know what it would be? It would be what our customers have told us. We're a world-class dot connector. Last question for today. Favorite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, spending time with my wife and my three boys. Luke, this was awesome. Where could people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? Sure thing. So on Twitter, I'm at, at Luke Groman, all one word, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N. And online, I am at F-F-T-T, Frank, Frank, Tom, Tom, dash L-L-C dot com. Luke, thank you so much for coming on Futures Radio Show. Thanks for having me on, Anthony. It was a blast. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.